As we're learning search engine optimization, one thing that has always stood out to me is that the particulars of search engine optimization have always revolved around marketing. Search engine optimization is all about getting more people to find your site. Marketing, very simply, is getting more people to see your business and understand what it is that you do. Getting that visibility, it's all about marketing. The one thing that we have to remember though is that when people especially are using search engines, they have a very limited attention span. If they don't find what they want on that page, they're gonna leave immediately. And so the key here is to make our sites scannable. That means that within three seconds, someone can view the web page, understand where the information is, see the key words that will engage them, and make a decision that they wanna stay and view the information. Also, through being more scannable, we can also be more credible. I'm going to explain much more about how you can present a more credible presence to visitors as they come from search engines. Of course, contrast plays a large part in this. And by contrast, I mean making sure that the words and call to action elements contrast with their background. You can't have gray text on a gray background and expect people to see it easily. And we're gonna talk about the ultimate goal of our marketing, of our search engine optimization, and that's conversion. Getting people to do what we want them to do. Because conversions are what makes us money. Sales, leads, subscriptions, donations, whatever your goal is. And usually, it's little tiny changes will make big results. When we look at marketing, the primary purpose of search engine optimization is to get more people to your website. Once they're there, we want them to do what we want them to do. The problem is that most people will not spend long enough on the page in order to see what it is we have to offer. 80% of users are going to scan that page in a matter of seconds. Very few are going to read word for word the content that's on the page. In fact, in many tests, and Jacob Nielsen has been the leader of the testing and usability movement online. His deduction is that people don't even read. You can't even use the word reading to describe what people do online. They don't read sentences. They don't fully read anything. They only read a few words here or there on the page and ignore everything else and use that amount of information to determine if this is the right page. This is why we need to understand how to better use our headlines. If you remember back to earlier lessons, these are our H1s, our H2s, these are our headings, subheadings, our bullet points, and our paragraph headers. What I want you to think about is a newspaper. A newspaper has one headline. After that are multiple subheadings, some bullet points, paragraph headers, all enabling you to scan the newspaper very quickly and see the news that's there. When you find something that's interesting, you have enough information pointing you to that destination, and now you can spend the time slowing down and reading what's important. Or if you prefer not to read the text that's there, you can usually figure out what's going on just by looking at the headings, the subheadings, the bullet points, the bold text, we do the same things on web pages. So let's explore how we can do more marketing through our SEO. Let's explore the concept of scannability. You'll see soon enough how this applies to both marketing and search engine optimization. When we talk about scannability, we use the reference of a newspaper, that when people scan a web page, just as when they scan a newspaper, they scan headlines, subheadings, bulleted lists, bold text, hyperlinks, and, of course, large action buttons. What we're looking at here is things that usually are very contrasting to their background. Black text on a white background, a red button on a white background. These are things that grab people's attention so that when they're reading a page of information, they don't have to read every word. People, as they're looking at a page like this, they obviously look at the links. They're a different color, they're underlined, and they signify that there's more information if they click that link. 
they also browse the subheadings, the bullet points, and very short paragraphs. If you'll notice, this page maybe has two sentences to a paragraph. This makes it very easy for someone to browse through the information, and even if they maybe only read a few of the words, they understand the basic premise of what's being said. Now let's look at scannability and how we can improve the flow of the website as well as the ease of scanning for the visitor. Typically, when you go to a website, you see large blocks of text like this. This is one of Jacob Nielsen's tests where he had a number of versions of a website and each different group of visitors would be presented with a different homepage that had this text on it. He then measured the click-through rates and interactions that were resulting based on the type of text that was on the homepage for people to see. The first version was the control version. This is the version of text that was on the page. The second version was a more concise version. They took 50% of the words and said the same exact thing. And by doing that, the interaction level went up 58%. Because they were saying less with less words, people responded more. And we've seen this time and time again online whenever companies have gone to scaling back the amount of words on the page, the interaction level increases by almost the same rate. A scannable version used only one sentence and then bullet points. Again, the interaction level increased, not as much as the 50% version, but still a significant amount. Another version was the objective version. By taking out all of the promotional language, or as I like to call it, PR fluff, they just stated the facts. And in doing so, by taking out the promotional language, the interaction went up 27%. Now, the final version was a combination of all of these. By taking 50% of the words, removing all the promotional language, and providing a very scannable version with bullet points, what they created was a version that the interaction level increased 124%. By saying less in a more visual manner, it increased the people's willingness to interact with the website. Scannability is critical because on the average 600 word web page and a test that was done with graduate students, only 20% of the content was remembered. Usually, our websites are not being read solely by graduate students. So please evaluate your web pages and make sure they're scannable. Make sure that you can take advantage of a scannable, objective format using less words than you typically would use to explain something so that more than just 20% of the content will be retained by your readers. One thing about search engine optimization is when it's done properly, it can also help you create credibility with your website. When we want to establish credibility, we have to understand that when people only give us a few seconds to decide whether this is the right page for what I'm looking for, we have to realize that a bad site can create distrust. A site that doesn't give people confidence that their answer is here or doesn't relay that this is a trustworthy website in which to give credit card information or any other type of information, they're gonna pull that back when they don't trust the website. Good sites create credibility and create trust. I wanna talk a little bit about a study that was done a number of years ago at the Stanford University Persuasive Technology Lab. They performed a credibility study looking at hundreds of websites, multiple industries, multiple types of sites, and they asked the respondents to compare the sites based on which website is more credible than the other websites. And so they continued to evaluate all these sites and letting people know which ones were credible, which ones were not credible. And ultimately what it came down to is that participants made credibility-based decisions on the overall visual appeal. Now, before you think it's all about the fancy pictures or the flash videos or anything like that, the overall visual appeal had actually very little to do 
with the design of the website. It had more to do with the content, specifically not just how the content was written, but by how it was presented. What the respondents noted that particularly gave them trust, what these sites had in common was a consistent topography, layout, font size, and color scheme. If you want to create credibility and trust, that means that you need to have a consistent layout that utilizes font sizes in a particular scheme to show what is important, what is secondary importance, and the structure of the document beyond that. Also using topography with the font size to show what is important information and what is least important information, and then a complementary color scheme. And when you think about it, many of the sites that we use the most online, Google, Amazon, eBay, they don't have a design. The sites are focused mainly on the topography, the layout, the font size, and the color scheme. When you look specifically at industries that rely on credibility, and we've made this connection many times in this course, over decades, the news industry has refined the print versions of their newspapers, which is now reflected in the online versions. Credibility is based on the layout, the topography, the font size, and the color scheme. We can immediately tell what the primary headline is because it's larger and a different font than the rest of the information. We can tell the secondary information because it's a different color, it's still larger than the traditional text, and in order of the document design, it's secondary. Immediately, our eyes are drawn to the hierarchy of information, the headlines, the subheadings, the bullet points, which are text links to additional stories. And so even if you take a survey of different newspapers and their online versions, they carry along the same layout and document structure as their print version. Headlines, subheadings, bullet points, text links, it's very easy to find where the primary headline is and the subheadings are. Now even when we compare two websites from the exact same field, they have very much the same information. One website has put a lot of effort into the overall design, focusing specifically on the layout, the font size, the color scheme, and the topography. The other website has put a lot of information on the page, and it's very difficult to read the navigation because it's the same size as the text. There are no headlines. There are no subheadings. There doesn't seem to be the same organization level of the website on the right side as the left side. The left side looks much more organized, much more consistent, and the layout is much more pleasing to read. And because of that, that's why it looks more credible than the other website. You see, when you put too much into a web page, too much color, not clear enough instructions, this website doesn't have any consistency among the calls to action, the colors that are used, the information that is presented, and as a result, there's a lot of contradictory and conflicting information and calls to action. It doesn't create credibility or confidence that you're at the right place. So to create credibility, you need a consistent page layout. Have a consistent call to action. Color should not be distracting from the overall message of the page. Use it in primary areas to bring attention to your calls to action or to your primary headlines. Make sure that your use of color is complementary to the overall design and has a purpose. And most importantly, your content needs to have a hierarchy. Use complementary fonts and font sizes to distinguish H1s, H2s, H3s, and additional headings, and make sure your information follows that logical structure. And in doing so, you will create confidence in your users, and also you will increase your ability to rank for specific terms as well as long tail terms. And that's what the source of SEO is, doing things that are great for your users and having the benefits of increased rankings in the search engines.
the goal of all your search engine optimization efforts is simply to get people to do what you want them to do. You see, it's very easy to get rankings, but it's very difficult to make money with your business. And rankings assist you in making money. And so all of your rankings need to have a purpose in driving people to the goal what makes your company or makes your website money. So we need to figure out what makes you money. Figure out which visitor actions immediately make you money. If you have an e-commerce website, then obviously people buying things are going to make you money. If you have a lead generation website, people filling out a contact form or a lead form, that makes you money. Figure out the actions that people will take that lead to money, such as giving you an email address, signing up for a newsletter or an email update. You can then, since they have given you their email address, you now have permission to market to them until eventually they do something that makes you money. And then also look at those things that they don't make you money immediately, but they could result in a good customer. These are downloads, uh, free information, something that just gets people to do something on your site of value that could come back and develop into a good customer. For example, I love Tiger Direct at the top of every page, right next to their search box, you can sign up for their deal alerts and there's the email address. They make it very clear that this is what you're getting and this is the value transaction. This is critical in getting people to do something, to give you something of value, such as their email address, by you promising something of equal or greater value. Tiger Direct is saying, if you give us your email address, we will alert you to whenever we have a product on sale where you can save money. And so there is that value transaction of giving something for equal or greater value. It doesn't make Tiger Direct money when they get the email address, but they know if they market to you enough or if they give you the right deal, eventually you will buy and that will make them money. So be sure whenever you are asking for an email address, don't just simply put the email address form on the page. Tell the visitor what they will receive of value. I love websites that make it very clear what the conversion point is now. Harvest has two conversion points on the page. It's interesting that they name them differently. One is sign up now. The other is try it for free. First of all, I like that these two buttons are green. Sometimes green can signify money or action or go. And so it's good to test different colors depending upon what type of website you have. But having two different calls to action could make two different types of people respond. So we can sign up now, and there's the 30-day free trial we see immediately underneath of it. And there's the other one that try it for free, sign up in 60 seconds. It depends on what's driving that person who's viewing that page. They know where to go to convert, and you're giving them two different and distinct messages that could draw different personalities to convert. The Motley Fool uses a very similar technique that you can try it for 30 days or you can buy it with a 30 day money back guarantee. And it's very easy to see where exactly they want you to go for each product. A tourism website like the city of Deadwood, you can book your hotel, you can book a vacation, but in case you're not ready to book a vacation, that's where they put the email updates up at the top where you can sign up for the email. And again, they're giving you something of value, the latest events and information. Or you can get an official guide. So if you are planning a trip, but you're not ready to make a commitment at this point, then you can give not only your email address, but your name, your physical address that they can mail the guide to you. In terms of a lead, the email address doesn't really provide much getting a name and an address and sending a guide, well, that's more of a valuable lead. And then the highest action they want people to take is the lodging availability to book the trip. So be sure that your goals can be identified on each page of the website. Now, unfortunately, this works completely the opposite way when you don't make the call to action obvious. 
I love the content of this site. I love the concept of a USB drive that looks like sushi. The problem is, if you want to purchase it, it's very difficult to see where to go quickly. The price starts at $49, but is that the price for the entire set? Is it just one? There's not enough information to make a decision, and ultimately, it's very difficult to find the buy link because it's the same size, the same font size, and the same layout as other options in that menu bar. Because of that, it's very difficult to see, and so when it's not obvious, people won't find it. Ensure that your sites have a clear call to action. A benefit statement near the call to action is always complimentary and it will assist that conversion. Make sure that you're using contrast in a way that makes that call to action clear and understandable. White space is a great way of creating contrast around a call to action button, instruction, or text. And make sure that it's consistent throughout your website. Changing the position of calls to action will confuse people and it will reduce their confidence in your website. Now, when you start a focus on conversion as the point of the site, it's always good to evaluate every single page of your website to be sure that the conversion points are clear and obvious. You see, search engine optimization and usability are so tied together. Usability is simply making your site easier to use and making the call to action points understandable, clear, and easy. And so applying search engine optimization principles to usability, it's very easy because when you understand user behavior of usability, it increases your search engine optimization ability. And if you think back to earlier lessons, we looked at how words and search words create user intent. And what we were doing was understanding user behavior based on the words they were using. And so the words that attract people to the site, they will attract people to stay on the site by giving them the words that they were searching for, using them throughout the content and key areas will keep them engaged on the site and will help them find their goal. One example of this is that you have to be clear and again, think like the visitor. What will assist them and what will help them? This was a website that couldn't figure out why so many people were starting the order process, but then never finishing. Well, it didn't take much just to look at the page and see that the buttons are in the wrong order. You see, user behavior, when you start watching it, the first thing users do when they look at their shopping cart is they look at the total price. It's very good, it's bolded. We know exactly how much we're paying. But then what is the first thing people look for when they're ready to continue the process after they view their shopping cart? They look for the checkout button. And unfortunately, the checkout button is placed all the way on the left side of all the options instead of on the right side, right underneath the total. What's underneath the total is the cancel order button. And see, this is simply a matter of rearranging the buttons so that the one thing that you want people to do, which is the checkout, is the biggest, most obvious, and clearest choice of all the other buttons. There's no reason to have a cancel order button. Make sure that your checkout is close to the total because that's what people want to do, and you should enable them to do that. Other websites simply make the process too big and bulky, and they push everything down to the bottom of the page. Looking at my shopping cart on this page, I can remove it, I can update it, I can look at shipping, I can apply a coupon code, I can do all these things except for checkout. I can't find where the checkout button is. I have to scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page in order to find it because of all the other offers and confusing steps that have been placed in my way. You see, we can also create confusion just through text. John Deere used to have a website, and when we looked at the website and the content there, it was very obvious that the content really didn't educate. 
The content underneath their familiar green and yellow exterior isn't just a redesign of the compact tractor, but a transformation where power is no longer measured by horsepower, where implements practically attach themselves and comfort. What is this text really saying? This text isn't saying anything. It's not giving you any helpful information that lets you know what you can do. Does this work for you? Does it provide enough information to make an intelligent decision that this is the right tractor for my needs? Their new website focused more on answering that question. And I love how it simply says, get more done. And now all of a sudden we have more and more keywords that are related to the content overall. Farmers, estate owners, horse enthusiasts, ranchers, and then they go into what you can do, mow, till, lift, dig, operate. And so you see, we're using keywords that are all around, not just the word tractor, we're using keywords that are all related to it, that are showing here are the answers, here are the things that you can accomplish. Another way that we can make a real simple change in order to make big results is to require less information. CBS Sports has fantasy football leagues, and you can sign up and invite your other friends to sign up for fantasy football as well. However, when sending out an invitation to the rest of the league, I noticed that this was the form that was required in order for the rest of the league to sign up. And in it, I had to create an ID and a password. And can I say that no one really enjoys creating a new ID and a new password? It's not really one of the most enjoyable things to do. But then every single field was a required field. City, state, zip, phone number, birthday, gender. And the only thing that wasn't required was your favorite NFL team. Now, all this form is for is for someone to join an already existing league in fantasy football. Why do they have to know my address, my city, my state, and zip? When I sent this out to the rest of the league, no one responded. However, when I went and resent the information, all that was required was your ID and password, first name, last name, zip code, birthday, and email. By requiring less information, it made a lot more people take the actions and join the league. The other form was too long, and it comes back to that value proposition. All I'm doing is signing up for a fantasy football league. Why do you need to know my address, my phone number, all those things? Because it wasn't relevant, and what they were asking for was too much value for the value that was being asked. The color red is something you do need to be careful of you can create confusion because red attracts your eyes. I call it the most visually assaulting color that can be used online because we can't control how people's monitors display the color red. There's too much intensity, too much hue, and every monitor is so different. Even projectors are different. And so you can never depend upon how the color red will be rendered on a monitor. And when your call to action is a small, tiny red button, however you're using red all over the page, it gets lost. Red denotes importance. It denotes attention. And so by using red in key areas, when your primary call to action is a blue button with white text, what you're doing is calling people's attention to all of the buttons that have red and then saying this blue button is not important. And so just by making small changes to your design, you can focus people to the place that is most important and get them to go where you want them to go. So usability can work hand in hand with search engine optimization. Call things what they are. Reinforce keyword strategies with benefit statements. And remember that sales decisions are ultimately emotional decisions. So including benefit statements that sell to both the logical and the emotional sides of the brain, that will help create more keywords that are relevant to the transaction. Don't rely on feature and specs because people expect to see those, but they don't contain many keywords. Answer problems. What 
problem does this product, this service, whatever that is on the page, what problem does it solve? Use those problem solver statements because those contain keywords. Usability and search are hand in hand because usability is when you look at a page from the standpoint of a user saying, is this the right page that answers my questions? And when you're hand in hand with search, you're also looking at the page, making sure that there are enough words that people will know it's the right page. Ensure that your call to action uses a benefit statement that provides value for the value that you're asking. Use contrast around key call to action areas. You can do that with white space and consistent placement throughout the website. Content is your primary tool for creating new rankings and additional rankings and driving people to conversion. Search engine optimization, as you've seen throughout these lessons, is vitally related to your content. You need content to optimize in order to gain rankings. People need content because they're searching for answers. And so the more content you have on your website, the more visibility you're going to get. And also, the better content you have on your site, the more people are going to link to your site as a source of information, as a reference, and as a referral to other people. So when you've got great content, it will naturally spread out. People will tell others about it, and it creates conversation. Content is the key to developing a following online, developing rankings, and getting more people to your site. And so let's look at some examples at how content can help create that bond with the visitor that lets them know they're in the right place, but then also can reinforce rankings. I like high rise because it follows the page layout techniques that we've seen. A clear headline, clear subheadings, short paragraphs, images that are complementary to the content, bullet points, and the bullet points are very clear in the things that you can do. It answers questions. And in doing so, it not only focuses the content on the primary keyword, but all the problem solver keywords that are related to the overall concept. You can take a different tack, such as this website here, where it focuses on a cup warmer. Cup warmers are fairly boring. That is, unless you read this content. We've all been there. You just brewed yourself a steaming cup of liquid loveliness. You get back to your desk to a flurry of urgent emails, and by the time you've averted all manner of minor disasters, like the superhuman workhorse that you are, your cup of steaming refreshment is stone cold. I love that type of content. It's humorous. It engages you. It makes an emotional connection because you can remember the last time you had a cup of coffee that got cold at your desk because you got too busy. And so here, they're not so much focused on just giving you the features and specs of a boring cup warmer. They're creating excitement. They're creating a visual experience in your mind that can connect you to the product. But then they rely on customer reviews that also use keywords because it's now the customers that have bought the product talking about how great it is, and they are all calling it what it is. In fact, what I noticed is there are more people calling it a gadget in the customer review than the actual word gadget is used on the page. And so in this place, the customers are helping optimize the page by calling it what it is. One of my favorite sites to use as an example for content is the Fisher-Price website. You'll notice that the home page isn't completely focused on toys because most people when they think of Fisher Price they think of baby toys. However, the navigation is about play and development for grandparents, games and activities. You can upload photos of your baby. You can look at an age by age playtime guide based on the month of the baby. You can get updates, you can share photos. Wait a second, I thought this site sold toys. Well, as you get into the site, it's not just about toys. It's about understanding how your baby plays, and there's all these bullet points that talk about what the baby's doing at this age. And then, recommending the type of toys. You see, they're not selling toys. And then, 
the types of toys that they're recommending. You get a playtime guide. You can get advice and also for special needs. But then you get into the content about, okay, stacking and sorting toys are right for this age. Here's how you can play with them. Here's how they enjoy it. Fisher Price isn't selling toys. They're selling on being a better parent or grandparent. They are selling information. They're selling satisfaction. They're selling an emotional response to, I want to be a great parent or grandparent because I want my child to develop and to grow and to learn. And so what Fisher Price is doing is they are using content to become the experts in how children play and how you as a parent or grandparent can enable them to grow and learn and excel. They're selling confidence, not toys. And it's a wonderful way of creating that emotional connection. Another one is USB cell. They simply sell USB rechargeable batteries. However, when you start looking at how they are positioning themselves, they're positioning themselves from an eco standpoint, that using rechargeable batteries saves the environments and helps the planet. And so what some of these sites are doing, they're looking for the need beyond the need. That is, someone needs batteries, or in the Fisher-Price example, they need toys. But what they're selling is an emotional satisfaction. Fisher-Price is selling emotional satisfaction of being a good parent. USB Cell is selling the emotional satisfaction of saving the planet. And so by making an emotional connection, the need beyond the need, you can assist your conversion ability as well as increase rankings for a common concern and making that connection. And you're educating the consumer by educating them and also by knowing who you are and what resources you have, you can give unique information. Maybe it can be humorous. Maybe you can develop additional consumer reviews that focus on the product and using key words that you don't have to. It's all about building content that connects to the searcher.